A Democratic DA promised change. He delivered disrespect to crime victims. Now he's leaving office before voters could throw him out. Our story on pedestrian safety got people all worked up about jaywalking. So let's talk about how the rules of our roads first developed and whether Denver actually punishes anyone for jaywalking. Young adults with cancer can get overlooked. Tonight, together, we'll help them build careers, start families, whatever they are wishing for after a terrible diagnosis. What's lost is found. I find phones, AirPods, masks, lots of trash, so like lots of fireball shooters. One dedicated man tries to return what fell during the ski season and piled up beneath the lifts. And remember the target rock? It has an accomplice. All that is next. A Democratic prosecutor who promised criminal justice reform in rural Colorado is out, resigning less than two years into his first term. Alonzo Payne lost the backing of prominent Democrats as an investigation found that he had ignored and mistreated crime victims. Payne was under scrutiny from other law enforcement and from the public. He was facing a recall election. An investigation found that he had yelled at crime victims and didn't consult them when it came to plea deals or dismissing cases. Democratic Attorney General Phil Weiser is among those who clearly had lost confidence in Payne. Weiser returned a campaign donation from Payne four months ago, and yesterday the AG came out to announce that an outside monitor would be protecting victims' rights in the San Luis Valley. Today, uh, District Attorney Payne resigned, and the governor appointed A.G. Weiser to serve as interim D.A. until Payne's replacement is picked. Denver is currently on pace to tie last year's number of deaths on our roadways. 84 people lost. It's the most since Denver started its campaign to try and eliminate traffic deaths. When we talked last night about recent hit and run deaths on Colfax, we got a good bit of feedback saying that those people are responsible for their own deaths because they were jaywalking. Certainly everyone has a role to play in safe streets, but it got our Steve Steger thinking about the history of jaywalking and whether those rules are enforced in the city. It's a street with a lot of nice destinations along it. it could be a very walkable place, but the fast cars do make that harder. It isn't hard for photojournalists to get video of people navigating a sea of speeding cars on Colfax because a lot of people do cross where they technically aren't supposed to, and not many of them face the music for it. In the last year and a half, Denver and Aurora police combined wrote fewer than 100 jaywalking tickets in their respective cities. Jaywalking seems to anger drivers more than police officers here. Jaywalking used to just be walking. University of Virginia professor Peter Norton says driver anger has a lot to do with the history of the law. And jaywalking began as a term of ridicule. The word jay meant hick. Uh, it was actually harsher than that. And it was a way to sort of uh, pressure people out of using streets the way people had always used streets before. When cars were new, a lot of people wanted them banned from cities where they posed danger to people who walked in the streets. He says auto dealers and car clubs pushed back, successfully defeating the bans, then pushing for laws to restrict walking in the streets, hence jaywalking. They got together and said, uh, look, we need a new message. And their message was, it's the motor age, it's the 20th century, times have changed, get with the program. If you still think walking around in streets is okay, then you're stuck in the past. Laws changed and slowly norms did too. Well, one of the techniques uh, in the 1920s was to get into the schools and teach children streets are for cars. So we're now, you know, three or four generations into this. And so we tend to all grow up thinking it's quite natural and normal for streets to be for cars and pedestrians doing anything except crossing at the crosswalk with the signal as jaywalking. Traffic engineering professor I spoke with yesterday said that traffic engineers need to not look so much at fault in crashes and start looking at the system surrounding them. Plenty of reasons that people might be jaywalking. They may feel unsafe at crossing an intersection because of turning drivers. Maybe the signal there is too short or the nearest crosswalk, as is the case in a lot of places on Colfax, might be a little bit too far away. They just kind of want to 
get across the street. And we know that systems impact the way that people move because drivers do it all the time. Oh, this road's terribly designed. That's why I had to make that U-turn. Yeah, that's what this road is uh, uh, terribly. The speed limit's not good. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do here. Yeah. I think, yeah, the drivers, drivers get drivers it. Get people it. walking do the same. Yeah. All right, Steve, thank you. Journalists are often criticized for having what's called a windshield perspective about safe streets, as in viewing the issue only through the eyes of drivers, through the windshield. And that's actually fair criticism. But driving is how the majority of us get around these days. So let me tell you why I, as a driver, want safer streets. For starters, because I don't want my neighbors to die needlessly if they're biking or walking. Also, because I bike and walk sometimes, and I am a big fan of staying alive myself. Because I do not believe that jaywalkers deserve to get hit and killed. And I actually don't believe that the people who write into us and suggest that believe it either. I just think that that's some kind of performative cruelty that some folks think is cool these days. From a purely selfish perspective, no driver wants to carry around the knowledge that they hit and killed someone, even if that pedestrian was outside a crosswalk at the time. Safer streets matter to me because I have kids that I'm teaching to try and make smart decisions, but I know they won't always. And we engineer the world around us in all kinds of ways to make sure that small mistakes in life don't result in death. We do that a ton for drivers. Center lines, guardrails, rumble strips, dividers. I'm not telling you to give up your car. So maybe this makes what I'm saying a windshield perspective. But from where I sit, in the driver's seat, my life isn't any more valuable just because I'm behind the wheel. The criminal investigation involving Colorado's best-known election denier has now led to the arrest of another election official in Mesa County. One of Republican clerk Tina Peters' employees is now facing charges related to uh, uh, election tampering. Sandra Brown turned herself in on charges of conspiracy to commit criminal impersonation and trying to influence a public servant. She was working as the elections manager in Mesa County. The warrant says that Brown was involved in that plot to make copies of election software. The court documents say that Brown, Clerk Peters, and Deputy Clerk Blind Nisley allowed an unauthorized person access to the voting system. For the very first time, the affidavit names that mystery man allegedly snuck into the system under an assumed name. Connor Hayes. He lives in California. The warrant says the cameras were turned off in the office to keep him a secret. So far, he's not facing charges, but he is under investigation. He's a, pro sur a former pro surfer, and nowadays he's an election conspiracy theorist. For the first time in 12 years, Denver's going to have a wide open mayor's race. Three terms is, of course, the limit for Mayor Michael Hancock. The race is currently filling with long shot candidates as we await decisions from some big political names and we await to find out who big business wants to put in the mayor's office. A Republican mayor in Denver would certainly be a long shot. I mean, first in 60 years, as according to our partners at Colorado Politics, who report that Andy Rougeau is the latest candidate to join the fray, Army veteran and registered Republican. There are six others currently in the race. Uh, you've got Ian Thomas Tafoya, an environmental activist who leads Green Latinos. Terrence Roberts, longtime anti-gang activist who's acquitted of attempted murder for a shooting at a peace rally in 2013. Jesse LaShawn Paris, a social justice activist who's been vocal against Denver's camping ban. Ken Simpson, tech consultant, who's run for the office previously. Anna Burrell, who's called for more collaborative leadership in the city. And a perennial candidate, you see him every time around, Marcus Giovanni. A prominent name who told you here on this program that she was not running for mayor appears to be edging closer to the race. Former Denver Chamber of Commerce uh, head Kelly Bruff certainly would be powerful, uh, would be popular rather, with the powerful business interests who have backed Denver's last four mayors. Last year, Bruff told Marshall here on Next she was not going to run for mayor. She recently told The Post she's considering it. Colorado's moved into the top five states for business in CNBC's annual rankings, which are now putting a new emphasis on finding skilled workers as well as the availability of childcare in communities. Unlike some business rankings that just look at whether a state is friendly to a company's CEO and shareholders, the CNBC annual evaluations are kind of interesting because they also look at things like whether states are friendly to working from home, whether they are welcoming and inclusive to diverse groups of people who might move there for work. Colorado moves up four states on the list to fourth place this year behind only North Carolina, Washington, and Virginia. I would bet that every one of you out there is familiar with Make-A-Wish the nonprofit that grants special requests to kids with cancer? Fact is, young adults get cancer as well, 
and often they feel forgotten in a number of ways because they're, they're too old for support programs for sick kids, and yet they're far younger than most Americans who face a cancer diagnosis. That's why your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign this week supports the Dear Jack Foundation. That nonprofit offers young adult cancer patients, like Carter, support programs with people his age. He was 18 when what he thought was a basketball injury turned out to be cancer. Dear Jack also has a life list program. Think of it like a grown-up make-a-wish, where the requests come from people like Eurosa, who asked for help maintaining her real estate business while also fighting stomach cancer. And Laura, who asked for a career counselor to help her find a new career while she was battling Hodgkin's lymphoma. These are Coloradans who receive a cancer diagnosis right at that moment in life when so many people have big plans, college, career, starting a family. Dear Jack's Life List program helps them with the expenses of finishing their education, finding a rewarding job, continuing their career, or maybe even family planning with the added uncertainty that comes with cancer. Every dollar that we raise will go toward meeting Coloradans' Life List wishes. The last time they opened this program up for applications, it hit capacity in 15 minutes. If you scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, I'll send you that link to donate. As always, I'll never ask you to give a loan. I'll match the first 50 donations of $5. This is a chance to remind those young adults with cancer in Colorado that they are not forgotten, that what they wish for in their lives matters, and that we'd like to help. I think I found over 11 iPhones. He's like an amateur detective finding lost treasures after the ski season ends and the lifts stop turning. He deserves the, the recognition and the credit for being such a good guy. The Great American Beer Festival is back and demand for tickets has cooled off. Maybe all the cool kids are drinking those hard seltzer Sam. And another rock in Colorado bent on revenge against cars. You've been warned. Next. Lost and found. When you report something lost, how often is it really found? I, I've never even thought about reporting a lost item that I've dropped on a ski lift. Into the snow it goes, I figure, ah, it's gone forever. Marshall Zellinger introduced us to a teenager in Summit County who was putting the found back in those lost situations. He's part environmentalist, part detective. You can search for Miles, looking for a lost item on a mountain. All the colorful cards are credit cards. Or you could let Miles search for you. During the summer, I go underneath the chairlifts and uh, go looking for lost items. 16-year-old Miles Vale finds what gets unveiled once the snow melts at Keystone. I find phones, AirPods, ski passes, all sorts of random things. I remember the feeling that something had left my pockets. Andrew Knoll in Boca Raton, Florida, lost his iPhone during an annual ski trip to Colorado this past winter. My cell phone was like our, our lifeline of making it back to the right spot at the right time. He and his buddy found their way home, even without the phone he lost at Keystone. The phone recovered months later by Vale, Miles Vale. I found someone's phone. It had a picture of a dog on it, and the caller actually had the person's phone number on it. So he asked me what my background was. And honestly, I didn't recall if it was a picture of me and my significant other or it was a picture of Alan, which was the dog. So I was able to take the phone number off the caller and contact him via the number on the caller, which I think is pretty cool. When I realized that that's what he did, I knew like this was a special type of person. Andrew's phone is one of 11 miles found. I have two left but waiting for those people to respond to me. Like the person whose phone powers up to a lost iPhone screen with a phone number. All Miles asks for in return is the cost of shipping. It was like pure altruism, like the act of going the extra mile without the expectation of getting anything in return. And I know that, that that's a different type of person. But if you're gonna reward him, I mean, reward him. I've had people pay me like three bucks for their phone. It's like, I found your really expensive phone and that's all you're gonna give me. And it's like, well, at least they gave me something. Andrew sent Miles a gift card. Turns out Andrew had phone insurance, paid 200 for a new one, and traded his found phone for 400 He actually basically gave me $200. His hard work awarded me $200. So I split that in half with him, which is still selfish of me. I should have gave him the whole damn 200 bucks. <laughs> like I said, Miles doesn't ask for anything but shipping. I just do it because it's fun to clean up the community and help return people's lost items. Give him something besides three bucks. All right, Keystone, 
has a lost and found database, which includes the lost item, the location of where it was likely lost. The trail maintenance crew collects items they find throughout the year and tries to match it with the database. There's even a mountain cleanup day, which happened last month with volunteers cleaning up trash and collecting lost items, probably not powering up the phone, yeah. looking at the dog collar and connecting someone in Florida with their lost item. I, I, I love everything about that story. I love the altruism. I love, I love the guy admitting he should have sent the whole 200 bucks to him. I mean, it's just what a cool adventure. There is a neat part because there's other things he finds, like the AirPods, which you don't really have a name on them, so he gets to keep those if he cleans them. One tip from him real quickly. If you have a GoPro and you lose the GoPro, before you lose it, take a picture of your phone number or address. He can look at that and send it back to you. He's got GoPros that he can't connect with people. Oh, that's super interesting. Good tip. All right, thanks, Marshall. The beer will be flown at GABF for the first time since 2019. What happened to the frenzy to get tickets to America's Biggest Beer Fest? Rocks have been wrecking cars on next for years now. I, I don't know why you find this so amusing. Oh, no, I get it. I get it. It's pretty good, yeah. We got a new one next. Great American Beer Festival tickets went on sale to the general public today, and unlike days of old... Apparently, no need to rush. I guess craft beer is not cool anymore. I don't know. I'm, I'm still going to be there. Uh, that's not an indicator of whether or not it's cool. Not at all. The festival celebrating American craft brewers is back at the Colorado Convention Center after a two-year pandemic hiatus. It's a smaller space this year, two-thirds of the size of recent GABFs due to some construction there. In 2019, the festival failed to sell out for the first time in more than a, de a decade. Even with the smaller space, there are still tickets available this year. Today would have been a good day for a frosty beverage. We were just one degree shy of that record. 100 still stands in the record books. Last set back in 2003 here in Denver, but 99, not just for us, but up into northern Colorado too. Several spots in the triple digits off to the eastern plains and 99 in Grand Junction. Tonight I am monitoring a couple of showers, thunderstorms trying to cruise in. If anything, just a bit of Virga. That's the rain showers that really won't make it to the surface because it is just too dry. Scattered storms up in the mountains through the foothills and again, maybe a couple of sprinkles here in Denver, but I wouldn't count on much. Everything moves out overnight. Some sunshine to kick off the day on Thursday, but we'll be tracking a better chance for storms tomorrow afternoon. Right now, it doesn't look like anything severe, but it will be another hot day. Back to the upper 90s into the triple digits for much of eastern Colorado. A brief little cool off, though. Hey, coming our way early this weekend. Remember the Target Rock, that boulder at Colorado Mills parking lot that used to take out unsuspected drivers who ventured too close? Sad to tell you, the Gorilla Rocks continue their attacks upon our community. I introduce you to the Walgreens Rock. Alan Minetta captured the boulder and the poor driver who hit it at the Walgreens and Wheat Ridge off 44th and Wadsworth. That's a nice vehicle to be propped up on that rock like that. Is it immature that we continually show pictures of cars high centered on rocks? I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I think this is this is a public service. You always get the last word around here, so we'll have your feedback and how we're helping young adults in Colorado who are battling cancer. That's next. When kids are diagnosed with cancer, there are support systems for their families, the Make-A-Wish program, to give them something to smile about. When a 19-year-old is diagnosed, 25-year-old, 30-year-old, there are fewer support groups, and there's no Make-A-Wish. So in comes the Dear Jack Foundation, which has a life list program granting the wishes of young adults fighting cancer. They need help finishing education or establishing a career, starting a family while simultaneously battling cancer. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word THANKS to 303-871-1491 to join me in donating. Every dollar will be used here in Colorado. See you next time.